Attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Happy Hello. New Year. Happy New Year. Wait, where's my Happy New Year thing? There it is. Yep. Oh, there. Hey, that's, for two inch. That's beautiful, Steve. You worked hard on that, I could tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, it took me a long time to get those watermarks on there. Exactly. Hey, um, welcome back to our webinar series, C4AA Basics. Um, Fundamentals. What's that? It's called C4AA Fundamentals. This is number six. Fundamentals. Okay. Uh, it's the new year. I'm going to let go of those little perfectionist things. I'm just going to go with how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny that you would talk about that because actually that is what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about creative process. Um, and actually, uh, Leslie Birch put up, when we asked about process, we asked, you know, what are people working on? What obstacles you have? And she wrote, beginning new year in a good way. And hopefully this will be a webinar that will help you begin the new year in a good way. Yeah, I agree. Um, we have some uh, things that we can talk about, but it's, this is a whole chapter of this book that Steve and I are working on. And so there's a lot of different things we can kind of emphasize or talk about or gloss over. So one of the things we are asking for those of you that are just joining is, what are some of the obstacles or barriers that you have around process, around doing your actual work? And just write those into the chat or into the questions part and um, so that we have an idea. Martin says, um, has a hard time moving forward when I don't have all the answers. I kind of get frightened and anxious. By the way, I've been reading Hope in the Dark and it's real good. Um, yeah, that is a good book. That, that'll help. Um, for sure, that is a book that I recommended, I think, in the first webinar, and uh, I said it helped me get through the second election of George W. Bush, where I was like, what is happening? But it's also, I think it's important what Martin writes about how to move forward when you don't have all the answers, when you haven't actually figured out how to put everything together. Um, and I think that's a key part of the creative process, too. And so, uh, you know, we'll cover that. We'll cover a lot of stuff. We won't be able to cover everything about creative pro process, obviously, but we're going to be coming back to this topic over the course of webinars in the future. So, Steve, you ready to begin? I am ready. Um, so, what we're going to do is give a few recommendations that we have <laughs> put together um, in the past. Um, these are both for artists and activists, um, activists that work in organizations kind of have a harder time um, with the creative process. Some of you that have that are practicing artists um, know that this is an ongoing thing. Like you don't just uh, figure it out in school. There's not a class on this and then you're, you're set. It's kind of an ongoing refining process. And the beginning of the year is a good time to look at it again. So these are recommendations that we made based on um, working with artists and people in organizations where the, the, I would say the people working in organizations, it's a little bit more extreme of a problem, right? Yeah, and this is, we like to think about this as our New Year's resolutions. I mean, we all come up with New Year's resolutions like, okay, I'm not going to eat as much barbecue. I was just down in Texas, and I probably ate my weight in barbecue, okay? And, of course, I shouldn't be doing that. I will do it again, no doubt about it, okay? Um, I should be getting more sleep. I'm never going to get more sleep. My kids get me up way too early. But I do have a resolution to be more creative. And so this is going to be the kickstart for your New Year's to work on your creative process. Yeah, it'll be a refresher for some, some new ideas for others. But it's always just a good reminder at the beginning of the year. Um, one of the things I'm also thinking of is when we worked in South Africa, and we had this great workshop um, with, a, with Sweat there, the organization they're called Sweat. And um, they were like, so ready to go. And then we had a phone call with them about a month later. And we're like, what, how's it going? You know, and they're like, ah, oh, we just don't even know how to get started, right? Like, we're so busy here. There's so much to do. Um, we don't know, how do we even get started with this stuff? And so some of these recommendations came out of that. And the first one that I have is that you need a book. And this also comes out well, working with students too. But could it be any books, Steve? Because I got lots of books. I got lots of books right here. Oh, yeah. Look. Those are books with writing in them. Do you have a notebook? Ah. Do I have a notebook? 
Oops. I've got a notebook. Let me see the inside. Well, you're not going to like it. Uh, does it have lines? It's got lines. It does? Okay. It does. You need a book without lines. Okay, wait, 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 wait. I got one. Hold on. This is actually from when I, I worked at Moscow State University. So that's Moscow State right there. And look. For the baddies? What? For the baddies? <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> See? There we go. All right, yeah. I'm ready. You need what a, am I supposed to do with this? Book because you need to draw in the book. Um, part of uh, coming up with ideas is like having them, it's not, it's, you got to get it out of your head, right? And this is a fundamental basic thing, right? Is to, when you have an idea, to write it down um, and then to, and to put it into pictures. I actually, years ago, put a whiteboard above my bed so that when I was in bed and I had great ideas, I could write them down. And because I would always think, oh, I'm going to, this is a great idea. This is such a great idea. There's no way I'm going to forget this. And then the next day I could not remember it. So that's why I needed to install a whiteboard above my bed. And I'm putting this up just to remind us that you don't really need to know how to draw. Um, as you can see, <laughs> this is uh, my drawing. I tend to draw in stick figures. I'm not the artist of this pair. But it's important to be able to just sketch ideas out. I actually tend to, I'm going to move this for a second and show you what I use instead of a whiteboard. In my office, I have a huge, um, with basically a four foot by six foot bulletin board. And I use it just to put all these ideas up there, scatter, you know, scatter plate and kind of put in with pins. Sometimes I draw drawings on the big white page. But it's about, as Steve said, the idea of getting the ideas outside of one's head and getting them out in front of you so you can actually see them. Otherwise, they either clutter up in your head, or in my case, I just forget them. Yeah, or you it's a way of um, sort of playing it safe, right? It's like you have a good idea, but maybe when you start drawing it, it's like, wait, how is this actually going to work? Um, and and you that's part of the process, right? It's like figuring out how to solve those problems or those little things. So the first step is making a drawing of what it would look like. Um, we have we do this in our workshops where we like have people draw what the action will look like or actually literally act it out because otherwise it just stays in your head. And another thing is you're probably not going to be working alone. And so saying like, no, it's it's going to be a box and it's going to do this. Like in my head, I'm imagining a 12 by 12 inch wood box. Steve might be imagining a, a 40 by 40 foot aluminum container, right? And so we need to make drawings so that we can communicate to each other about what we're actually thinking about as well as communicate to ourselves. So yeah. this is an important thing. You yeah, all right I now should have paper and a pencil, by the way, because we're going to we're gonna move forward with this. <laughs> so, Steve, do the ideas and sketches we write down, do they need to be uh, good ones? No, thank you. Yeah, so um, let's see. I'm going to turn off the slides for a second so I can show you better this. Um, this is a notebook that I bought in Columbus, Ohio, I think. And I had a solo show. This is April. See, it says Book of Bad Ideas, April 15th, 2012. And around that time, I had a solo show coming up, and I had no idea what I was going to do for it. And so I bought this book for $4, cheap book, not to, not, nothing I could be precious about. And then I wrote this at the beginning, which I'll read to you. It says, um, it has my name and my phone number. It says, if you find this, my notes will seem weird and crazy. Drop it in the mail. And then it has my address. And then I write, I'm going to fill this book with notes and ideas. This book is not special. It's just a vehicle to get some stuff out of my head and on paper so I can start to make some progress on my projects. I'm going to fill it as fast as I can. I'm going to destroy it. It cost $4. And I wrote this partly for anyone who would find it as like a caveat. So they would think, maybe they'd think I was more crazy for writing. I think it sounds a little bit more crazy, but that's okay. In, in four years, it is not, that never occurred to me. Um, <laughs> but also to myself, like the point of this book is not to like be later placed in a museum and held like this under glass so people could see my great ideas that I had in all my sketches. It was like, I... I'm committing to filling this with as many ideas as I possibly can so that 
I can move forward with this project that I'm trying to do. And I knew more ideas, the more ideas, the better, right? And, and I think, Steve, just before we move on, you brought up something really important, which is these are your ideas. They're not necessarily to be shared with anybody else. Um, yes, it's great if you make a drawing so you can show it to someone else and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking about. But the idea of this creative notebook is to just put out ideas without judgment. We talked earlier about this idea of the importance of just being able to explore in early stages of the creative process in our first webinar. And this is really about just getting those ideas out there and seeing how they fit together with one another. Anthropologists, for example, have notebooks of field notes, but then they have a notebook which they never show to anybody which is what they think, yeah, they do. And every once in a while a famous anthropologist dies and that notebook gets uh, revealed, like Bronislaw Malinowski. Turned out he hated the people he worked with. Um, and it should have never been released because his anthropology is wonderfully compassionate and beautiful and so on and so forth. And it turns out he was like basically a creep. Um, in any case, <laughs> that's why you should not show your notebook necessarily to anybody. You can rip ideas out of it and so on and so forth. But it's really about your personal notebook. Anyway. Steve, shall we move on? Yes. So, okay, so that's uh, number one. Start a sketchbook of questionable ideas. Number two, what is it, Steve? Is um, you need a space. You need a space to do this work. Um, it doesn't have to be like a really expensive loft studio in the newly renovated uh, former industrial building in the fancy part of town that you can't afford. Steve, can you move your camera so I can see the washing machine back there? No, that's not supposed to be there. It's an oven. <laughs> and it's just temporary. It's moving out. I'm so mad that it got put there in the first place, but we didn't have any other space for it. And then behind me is the crates for the capitalism sign and other stuff in crates. But this is my garage, right? Right, exactly. And, and, that, and that's exactly the point, which is you find the space. Don't wait for the perfect space. You find the space that you can actually have. And then you can crop it into what looks like a studio for Steve. Um, for my space, you can see behind me is actually, uh, it's my office. Now, I, I'm lucky enough to actually have an office, which I can walk to and which I can close the door. But before I had an office, my office was a cafe. Um, and essentially during the school year, when there's students coming in and out, my office goes back to being a cafe. Um, and it's a very particular cafe. It's a cafe where no one I know will ever stop by and where they play bad Euro pop music so I'm not tempted to hum along. And the Wi-Fi is not very good Wi-Fi and so I'm not tempted to check my email. Um, but it was my space, you know, lots of noise and so on and so forth going around me. But it was important that that was my creative space. And when I went there, I was creative. And then when I left, I had this sort of sense of like, I've done my creative place. I've done, been to my creative place. I've done my creative thing. Um, so it could be any place. I think it's really hard to work at home. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in my house, but I'm on a floor below and it's like separate from the house. Um, but because I, we, we, when we do our workshops, we do them out of town so that people have to get into this mental headspace of I'm leaving town, right? And when you leave town, that means you have to prepare to leave town. And you have to like do all the phone calls and pay all the bills and get everything set up so that you can be away. And this is why residencies are great or retreats or whatever. But how can you create that for yourself now in, in your house, right? Because you may not be able to leave your house to, to do this work. So it means like carving out a little corner of a room um, that, that's yours or a room altogether. Um, or maybe going to a cafe like Steve does, whatever it is. But what we're going to ask you right now, is there anything else we need to say about this before we have the... I think that's good. Okay, I'm looking at my notes. Oh, the other thing is you cannot be bothered. You don't want to be interrupted, right? So it can't be like a space that has distractions for you, whether that distraction is a partner or a cat or or the people in the cafe, if that's the kind of thing that bothers you. So the question is, is what kind of spaces will work for you? Yeah. And we want you to write this down. So Steve and I are actually going to disappear for a minute or two while you write this down and figure out what kind of spaces work for you so you can do this. So Steve, now is when we turn off our cameras and our microphones. Okay. Here we go. Go okay. to go, write it down, folks.
if you have stuff written down that you want to share, just go ahead and type it into the chat. Jabari, I saw yours, um, and we'll talk about them for a moment. But go ahead and keep writing. Okay, you can go ahead and keep writing if you're if you're still going. Don't let us stop you. But um, Jabari says spaces that work for me are spaces that are separate from work and home. They're mm -hmm. like in third place, right? In or near a community of other artists. That can be really yeah. important is to have that environment around you. Yeah, I think that's that's key. You know, one of the things I was thinking about, Steve, when we were off is about uh, Virginia Woolf's essay, A Room of One's Own. And which, you know, she really argues that in order to be creative, and she's writing particularly as a woman in the part of the, part of the 19th century, is she, she needed to be away from criticism. She needed to be away from responsibilities. She needed a place away from sort of someone telling her that she couldn't be creative like she wanted to be creative. Um, and so she was lucky enough to have an aunt who died and gave her, you know, 500 pounds. Uh, most of us don't have that. And so it is finding those third spaces, um, those places away from work and home that can work for you. And it will take a little bit of experimentation. Yeah. So Jen here says, my space is a studio that's away from home, but not too far with access to food, drink, and natural light. That can be key. I've been hungry at my studio before, and it's very distracting. <laughs> <laughs> you have a stove in the back, Steve. Just keep it down there. <laughs> no, that's leaving. That's not staying. Um, some noise, right. not completely silent, says Sydney. Artsy, paintings, photography, et cetera, displayed. Yeah, that's very different than working in like a, a place with like a fluffy carpet from the 80s and like wood paneling and or cubicle, right? Like it's hard to be as creative there. Music, no distractions from people I know. Yeah. That's good. Um, a corner in a room that is exclusively dedicated for my work, says Victoria. I've had that corner too. That's good. Um, okay, so let's keep going. Um, but we want you to think about and keep in mind this kind of space, right? And specifically, what kind of space will work for you and make sure that you have that. It's important. Um, okay, so you need to carve out time. You need to make time to do this work. Yeah, this is super important um, because there's so many other commitments on our time. We live in a society which is always pulling us towards something else we should be doing or could be doing. Uh, just the sheer amount of distractions that we have in the sort of internet age are just mind boggling. How many emails to respond to, how many Facebook posts to look at, so on and so forth. And that's not even our responsibilities for things like work, family life, our friends, and so on and so forth. Um, and those take up a lot of time. So Steve, Given that you're a busy guy, what do you do? When's the time? This is something I totally struggle with because I tend to find better, faster ways of doing the things I have to do and then commit to more stuff instead of, <laughs> instead of using the free time that I made. So I have uh, been in a long practice of trying to say no to certain things. Um, you know, like I don't have to take every opportunity that presents itself. Um, one of the things that we talked a lot about when I taught with creative capital was that like saying yes is a really good idea at the beginning of your career. And then there's this point that's really hard to tell when it happens, when saying yes destroys your life, you know, and it's like for a while it doesn't help you a lot. And then it just sends you down and knowing when that that's happening is helpful. Um, but another thing I would say is to figure out the things that you have to do, absolutely have to do, um, sleeping, eating, going to work, wherever that is, you know, like these are things that need to get done. And then be honest about how much time you have left and yeah. 
And if that might just be like a few hours a week and then figure out how you want to spend that time. Yeah. And also, I think for me, there's that of the sort of saying no, cutting out, carving out time. But it's also trying to figure out what times work for me creatively. Like, honestly, once five o'clock rolls around, I go home, I want to be with my family, I want to kind of check in with everybody, I want to start drinking a glass of wine, and my brain is just shot, absolutely shot. And so long ago, I realized for me, my creative time is in the morning. And actually, after about 12 o'clock, it's going downhill. Like right now, what is it, like 2 o'clock? You're not getting the best, okay? The best to me was actually spent this morning writing. Um, because th I find that that's when I'm less distracted. But for other people, it might be really late at night. Um, and so trying to experiment around with what times of the day can actually work for you is helpful as well. And the last thing I'd say about carving out time is like you also need to sort of carve out the time in your head. You can set aside an hour, but if you're like preoccupied with paying bills and a bunch of other stuff that you need to do, it's hard to create the space where you or to make the space where you can have creative thoughts, right? Because you're worried or anxious. So what I do is uh, in the, I have like a piece of paper out that I'm working with and writing down ideas. And then in the bottom right corner is like things I think of that I'm not doing. So I'll be like, oh, the cable bill. I got to pay the cable bill tomorrow. Cable bill, right? So that I know that that's there. I have addressed it. It's written down. It's something I'm going to take care of later. Um, so I don't have to worry about it. And, and that's something that works for me, but our next thing is for you to write down um, a sort of schedule, right? Like what times of day are going to, and you, you can, you know, this isn't set in stone. You can write it in pencil and change it, but what times of day are you going to, and how much time are you going to commit to this kind of work? And then what's going to be helpful for creating that kind of, how do you carve out that time? So we're going to turn off our cameras and mics, and we're going to let you figure this out for a minute. Okay? Steve, you ready? I'm ready. All right, so go. Hey. Also, that shouldn't have a question mark at the end of it. You should, it should be a period. And again, if you think you have a, a good one that you want to share, just go ahead and type it, type it in, and um, we'll share it with everybody. Um, we'll go ahead and keep writing. I thought of a um, quick story. Again, don't don't let me stop you writing, um, Steve. You'll like this. I had a student. Uh, I was a grad student at at the School Museum of Fine Arts at Boston, and after graduating, he had gotten a pretty good job. Became like a manager at a retail place, and it was taking all his time. And, he, and we happened to meet up and talk, and he was like, "What do I do? You know, I just can't seem to find time and." The, the job that I have doesn't really respect the fact that I'm trying to do these other things. 
And um, somehow it came up that he spoke a small amount of Korean. And I was like, why don't you tell him you're taking a Korean class? And that it happens every Tuesday at 7 p.m. And if they say, how's it going? You answer in the, like the very little Korean that you know. And no one else will know, right? <laughs> They'll be like, wow, it sounds pretty good, right? But that <laughs> they would never schedule his work on Tuesdays because he had his class, right? But really, that was his, his own personal creative time. And that's, that's how we, we made the schedule for him. <laughs> <laughs> Jabari writes, um, and I think this is a this is a key one, which is my challenge regarding time. I work a full time job, and afterwards I'm tired. Um, and I I think that's pretty common. Um, you're just spent afterwards. Um, and I guess the, you know the question then is, well, could you do something before? Um, what would it be like to get up an hour earlier, and just you know, you don't have to have three or four hours, but just an hour by yourself before you end up going to work. Or maybe you just say, look, during the weekdays, I can't do anything because I'm working all the time. I'm, and just give yourself some slack. I can't do it. I'm too exhausted. And then open up the weekends. Uh, that was how I got out of my first job. I, um, I, I would get up an hour before early and I would work in my studio for an hour before I went to work. And I had, this was like in the era of slides and I needed to fill a slide sheet to apply for a grant. And I just pinned that above the wall. And I was like, all right, I need to make enough work to fill this sheet. So I have 18 pieces because I didn't have 18 works of art at the time. Um, or even two, you know, 15 or something like I have two pictures of. Um, and that, that was, there was a target for me of like, all right, I want to get this grant. And then every day I would get up Again, I'm not as good at this now, but um, but it's an ongoing thing. So Kayla posts my studio hours, which holds helps keep me accountable and communicates to my students and colleagues. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah. There is just um, historians have started to recognize that this idea of sleeping a constant seven or eight hours is actually relatively new. Um, that oh, people awesome. traditionally have woken up in the middle of the night. Oh, okay. Um, called middle night and so you know for example you know back when you didn't have electric lights you went to sleep at six o'clock seven o'clock and then you woke up in the middle of the night you worked for a couple hours and went back to sleep and I remember I moved uh, moved in with my parents when I was like 21 or 22 and I loved my mom she was wonderful but she talked all the time and the only way I got any writing done was I would wake up at one o'clock in the morning and work till four and then go back to sleep again. Because uh, it, it was a small apartment. There was no, I mean, there wasn't room for me to do anything else. Um, and so you have to be creative, I guess, is that there is no such thing as a fixed schedule. That is, is this is a fiction that capitalism has created for us. And so what we have to do is push back against that and be creative to try to find our own schedules. So Steve, what's next? Next is, so something related but different, which is um, to have a routine. And you might think, wait, what's the difference between a schedule and a routine? Um, and the difference is, okay, you it's about what you do when you're starting your work, right? So one example, um, before I had this studio, I had a studio a little ways way down the road, and I had a coffee maker there, and I would only drink coffee there. So... That was how, that was one incentive to get me into the studio. But it also was like, okay, I get there, I start the coffee, right? And then like sit down with my coffee cup, arrange the desk, do certain, I had certain little things that I did, and then I would start, right? And so every day I had this pattern. Another thing was like, I would write notes on projects or like, this has third coat of paint, needs this, right? So then I didn't have to decide what to do. There were these certain, there were open threads left around that I could pick up. So uh, here's a great one because people love reading about the routines of artists. So I did a little Google searching. Um, Victor Hugo, when he was working on Hunchback of Notre Dame, had his valet take away all of his clothes. Um, and so, so he couldn't actually leave his studio. And he had a woolen smock. Um, and that's it. And uh, he finished. Hunchback of Notre Dame uh, two weeks early. Now, that is a little bit extreme. Um, 
what we're really thinking about is those little prompts that say, this is my creative space, this is my creative time, this is what I'm going to do to be creative. For myself, I smoke one cigarette. Um, I just, before I go into my office, I smoke one cigarette. It's the only cigarette I smoke in the day. When I travel, I smoke way too much. But when I'm at home, I smoke one cigarette a day, and that cigarette is absolutely essential to say, okay, now I'm going to be creative. And if I don't do it, of course I'd be creative, right? But it's that little treat, and it goes back to like Steve's coffee, that says, okay, I'm going to enter into this sort of sacred space, this different realm, which I allow myself this sort of luxury. It might be a chocolate bar, it might be a soda, it might be wearing a goofy red hat. Um, but it says that, <laughs> that, you know, I'm in this place where I'm going to do something different. Yeah. You know, Mr. Rogers comes into his house, takes off the things, puts on sneakers, takes off the one sweater, puts on the sweater that his mother actually made. You know that that red sweater that he wears? His mom made all his sweaters. Anyway, um, that was like, now I'm here and now we do this, right? And so for you, what is this routine that gets you into that mode, right? Because you can't just jump from everyday life into, all right, now I'm going to think these wild thoughts and work on these intense things. So what are those? You need, you need a transitional space, transitional routine. So what kinds of routines will work for you? And we want you to write it down. Write it down. And also, as you're writing it down, uh, put it up, yeah. post it in the chat, post it under questions, and so we can share some of those as well. Yep. All right, here we go. Okay, see ya. There's some good ones here. Oh, there's a great one. I, it's <laughs> funny. Food food is a cue, though. Right? right? Like food and drink. I uh, Can I read Carol's? Yeah. This is, this is from Carol. Um, when I put on, my an I'm gonna put on the animal print apron my Uncle John made me, it's like magic. <laughs> it, is. it is magic. Yeah. It's like you think it is. Um, Leslie, this is good too. Meditation before that's good. That's like a kind of thing that will get you into that mode. Um, and we're talking about all these different kinds of cues, right. That will help you. Oh, um, here, Jabari, it's got, it's got endless good ideas here. Um, I like to put on music, shoot some darts, make sure I have good lighting until I feel decompressed from work. Then I can start. We have a friend who, um, she makes these like beautiful, uh, you know, watercolors of plants, botanical drawings and stuff. But oh, she Emily. starts, Emily. yeah, <laughs> she starts everything by blasting Black Sabbath at like full volume. And that like gets rid of everything and now it's time. <laughs> and I've tried it and it works. <laughs> yeah, and, and it may not be Black Sabbath for you. And, and part <laughs> of all of this is about experimentation. As you try something, ah, that didn't work. Try something else, maybe that didn't work. Part of the creative process is learning what is the creative process for you. Um, and it's wonderful to read 
all of these posts about the creative processes of great artists and so on and so forth. But the main use for it is not to find a model, but to realize there is no model. It's all idiosyncratic. And it's all about finding what works for you. So our next one is about less pressure, right? Because now you've got you know your routine, you do your thing, you show up, and it's like, all right, I don't have any ideas, right? I got to be creative. Yeah. I've got to be genius. And you don't. Ow. You don't have to make masterpieces every day. The, the example I like to give is if I gave you like an oboe, uh, assuming you all don't know how to play the oboe, I hope that's a safe assumption. Some instrument you don't know how to play and sheet music and said, I want you to play this oboe and I want you to play this, this piece of music perfectly the first time. It's impossible, right? Like you need to be able to play around with it and make mistakes and see how it works and practice, right? And that often we're our own worst enemy when it comes to this stuff. It's like you you hold yourself to the standard where I have to be making masterpieces every day. And like every day I don't make some brilliant thing, it's a disappointment. And so how do we how do we take that away from it where we can make things that are or just I don't know, getting in there and working, right? And, and I think that that problem is, is complicated by those of us who are interested in working on arts and social justice and arts and politics and arts and liberation because we feel in some ways that the weight of the world is weighing upon our shoulders. That who am I to give myself this space to do something silly when there's people that are dying out there? And they are, okay? Or when people are in prisons and people are locked up and people are getting deported and all of this. That sort of pressure will keep you from doing anything. Um, it is important to do work that addresses those issues, but you also have to just pull yourself back a little bit and give yourself the freedom to say, this may not actually result in bringing about that change right now, but it may in the future. And having that sort of freedom of like, don't have the world upon your shoulders. In order for you to create something that can transform the world, you need the freedom to play. And you need the freedom to be silly and stupid. Yeah, I would say as someone who makes this kind of work, like I've seen, it's not just in my own head, like there's other people that, that um, hold me to these weird standards of extremes. One is that somehow every day I'm working on um, a project that is going to topple some powerful thing, right? which I, I'm not every day, you know? And when they're like, why did you make this project? It just seems funny. And I'm like, because I need to keep the funny thing, in, like that muscle exercised so that someday when it all kind of fits together, it will work. But if I don't practice it, I, I don't, those muscles atrophy, right? Um, and then the other end of the spectrum is why you do this all every day. It's like, well, me just existing as a creative person, I get in the studio every day, like, that's enough. And it's not. <laughs> it's not. Are you saying, Steve, are you saying we need a little pressure? Yeah, yeah. A just a healthy amount true. of pressure. And aspiration of like, you know, like, you know, that's the reason that you're watching our webinar and not reading the artist's way and like calling it good. Um, it's like you have political, we have political goals, right? Like we do want to affect change in the world. But just to like make, you don't need to hold yourself to this thing of every day I'm going to try to topple Trump, you know? And, and I think that part of that circles back to this idea that what this is about is creating a creative habit that takes place over a long period of time that makes you an artistic activist. And therefore, if you think about your career and your creativity over a long process, then you get a day to goof off. You get a day to do something silly. And actually, the great thing about it is, in that moment of doing something silly, there's every chance that you're going to come up with a breakthrough, which is going to make the super serious art actually really effective. But you got to get there by taking a step back, lowering the pressure. So uh, what we want you to do now Well, is, I, I want to um, read something we actually wrote about. Because oh, okay. I think it'll be helpful. Um, this we, we need to practice, play, mess around, and make mistakes. 
Artists and activists alike self-censor ideas too frequently because they aren't clever, or creative, smart enough, instead striving to create masterpieces. We need to give ourselves permission to experiment in disasters, to muck about and test the ridiculous, absurd, silly, and above all, stupid things, unfundable things, ultra-violent things, insane things, things that will make your boss, your board, your funders, or the police very nervous. We don't need to act on those thoughts, but we need to be able to think them. And I think this gets to something we'll talk about later too, which is the pressure makes us conservative and we need to be able to be wild. So we want you to think about for a minute, what's gonna work? What are ways that you can kind of lower the stakes and do it to be able to practice and think of things that are too, too out there um, in order to find the things that will work. So take a minute, write those down, let us know what you have and we'll come back in a second. So Leslie has one here, um, treat like stand-up comedy. What would SNL do? Um, that's a, that's good. a good one. I actually was lucky enough to go see Saturday Night Live in the studio once. And it's crazy. Like it really hits you that they write everything in a week mm -hmm. and all those sets and stuff are being like, you see them changing it right there and it goes down to the second and it's nuts, but it can't be perfect. Right. So one of the things that we do in our trainings is we end all of our trainings with a 24-hour action from conceptualization of the idea to building all the props to performing it out on the street is 24 hours. And we do that on purpose because there's only so much you can do in 24 hours. You can't get it perfect. And activists and artists often work for months and months and months on trying to get it perfect. And we artificially create a space and a time so they can't be perfect. And it is absolutely liberating. And we get great results too. And there's always something wrong with it in the end. But that, we learn from those things. Yeah. Uh, in fact, yeah. We've got a great example of perfection and imperfection. Yeah, this was a, this is from a story. Wait, are you talking about Macedonia? Or are you talking about um, the painting? No, I'm, ta I'm talking about Louis Louis. Yeah, okay. So uh, <laughs> this is about embracing imperfection. And this is like my favorite story about this. I went to school at the San Francisco Art Institute. That's where I did undergrad. And um, they always told us, I heard this story multiple times about this woman, Jay DeFeo, in a painting called The Rose. Some of you may know this, but um, she worked on this painting, I think nearby the school, and it, it was in the school for a while. And the painting she worked on for, I wanna say decades. I have the notes here. Steve, maybe you can find it for me, but she started working on it. I think she worked on it for 12 years. And there was a point where there was so much paint on it. I think it was over 12 inches thick. I suppose the details aren't that important, but, um, she just kept, uh, oh, it says I have a slow connection. Actually, like stop. I'm going to stop I, to a webcam. Um, okay, so, so she kept working on this painting and adding and adding layers until it became more like a sculpture. Um, and I want to say that she worked on it for 12 years. You'll forget. I'm still me. looking, Steve. I'm still looking. 
Okay. Um, and um, eventually she had to move it. I think uh, they wanted to show it in a museum in Pasadena. And they had to carve out a section of her wall, like around the window, in order to get the painting out with a crane. And the painting was like hundreds and hundreds of pounds at that point. This was the only painting that she worked on. And when it got to the museum, um, she got keys to the museum so she could go in at night and continue to work on it. And this was, the story was told as like, this is something you should aspire to. Like you think you work hard, you should work harder. And I was always like, this woman sounds kind of off, right? And when I looked into it, no one talks about this. They talk about how noble it was for her to work on this thing for so long. But for eight years. Eight years, right? Um, and, but to me, it was like, no, this is like obsessive behavior. And it turns out at the same time she was drinking and had a drinking problem and got divorced and her family life fell apart and she was not healthy while she did this. And it was, it's not a, a thing to aspire to. It's like, you know, in that time, I don't think, you know, in her mind, the painting was getting better and better and evolving. And maybe it was. But there's another model, right? And the other model is, uh, you guys probably heard of the Kingsmen. They sang that song, Louie Louie. And they were from Portland and they went into a studio where you could just go in and set up and play a song and make a 45. And they did it in one take, literally one take, went in, recorded it and left and had their record. I don't think they realized it would be the record that it became. But what's funny about it and what I always love about it, and you'll hear this now too, is there's a mistake in the song. So um, I am going to put a link to a YouTube clip here for later so you can hear it. But around two minutes in, there's a guitar solo. And the guitar solo finishes, but it's like a 16-bar thing or something, right? And the singer comes in a measure early and starts to sing the line a measure early and then realizes he's come in too early and um, and steps away, and then the drummer does a fill to sort of cover it, and then he sings it again. And you'd never notice it, right? Because um, it's just this, it transcends. It's It doesn't have to be perfect. If they redid it and made it perfect and made everything sound with the best microphones and digital technology, it would not be better. It would be worse because they made it good enough. And this is the thing, this is another sort of model is like, what's good enough, right? Where you're not distracted by the problems, the problems might even lend to it, but you got it done and you moved on. And with the Kingsmen, I like to imagine them leaving the studio after and being like, oh man, did you hear that? I came in too early. And they're like, do we do it again? But we don't really have $45 to make a new record. So I guess it's good enough, right? And it is, it's a great, it's a classic song. So um, this is a model, I think, for thinking about how to get away from perfectionism. Um, I, I see our connection is better, so maybe we'll bring the cameras back. Um, Steve, do you have anything to add? Your mic is off, buddy. Your, your mic is still, it's still off. <laughs> okay, here we go. It's not that it's just good enough. It's actually what makes the song is the imperfection. Because yeah. that's what gives it the party feel. Um, is yeah, that it feels yeah. like it's spontaneous. It feels like it's rock and roll. And it feels like you're there with the party. We all know those party songs. And what makes them great is it's like I can imagine being in a room with those people. And the natural part of a party is things are imperfect. They're sloppy. They're loose. You know, people may be drinking a little bit too much. And that's what makes it, as you said, transcendent. It makes it a sublime. It brings it into another moment. And so in a weird way, the imperfection is actually what makes it perfect. So um, should we skip the... Eh, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> no, don't. You can't spring. You can't skip it. So we're going to go right into it, which is the idea of bringing on the love. No. Oh, you want to do that? Okay. I want the Wait, love. The I want love slide. Yeah, let's talk about that. Okay. Yeah. We, we can, we can, yeah. So the, the idea of bringing on the love is this notion of when we're creating, where are we creating from? Where is our, where, like what sort of energy is fueling our creativity? 
is it about hatred for Trump, right? And hatred for the right wing, racist, xenophobic, sexist, misogynistic, homophobic worldview? Or is it about our love of a diverse, accepting, beautiful, beloved community, right? They're the same thing, just different sides of it. But when we actually create out of hate and we create out of anger, it's something, it fuels us, that's for sure, right? It also eats us up. It destroys us. And we're in it for the long haul. There's a, a, a Gary Snyder, the environmentalist, got interviewed recently and they said, you know, you were so right about the predictions you made and now all these things are happening. What would you say to someone that's joining right now um, when we're in such an awful place in the world? And he said, don't, don't save the planet because of how bad it is. Save it because you love it. Mm -hmm. and it. It has to come from that place, right? And so we can really be reactive and you can look at the news every day and get mad. I mean, that's kind of like what's happening with Trump right now is every day it's like, what do you do now? But that don't let that be the driver because it will your work will come from a place of frustration and anger that I think will, you know, some people who are frustrated and angry will relate to it. But that's um, that's not the most uh, that's not the deepest well. Right. And it doesn't it doesn't bring the best doesn't bring your best work. So a question we would ask you maybe to write down is, uh, and think about after we're done here is like, how can you bring that feeling to your work? How do you bring the love to your work? How do you let go of the frustration and the anger and the reactiveness and start thinking about how do we build the world that we want? And it might come back to reacting to things that are happening but the motivation, you're tapping into the deeper motivation, which is, I love this. I, I'm saving this place because I want to, because I love it. And, you know, it could be part of your routine. Like, for me, it's Sly Stone. <laughs> you know, you listen to that song, Everyday People, it is hard to stay in a hate, hateful place. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So you start with Black Sabbath, and then you go... <laughs> Like cleanse the palate and then bring in the... <laughs> and then get into the slide. Like stuff. exercising the demons, right? Uh, right? I think that's one of the sections of the book, actually. Anyway, um, well, um, we, we had a couple other things, but maybe we'll get to them another time. Um, I know it's, you guys want everything, right? But it's more important to us that we keep our, keep it get you back after your lunch break or whatever. Yeah, and it's also bringing the love is a good place to end because in the end, that's what we got for each other. Yeah. So I got a couple links for you. One is that link to the the uh, video of Louie Louie and that I queued it up just to the section so you can hear the end of the guitar solo and then hear him blow the line. It'll make you feel good. It makes me feel good every time I hear it. Um, and then um, this is a link for an evaluation. So we've asked for this in the past. It's been helpful for us to sort of figure out what we're doing well, how we can improve. Um, I'm going to post that right now. Just if you have a minute, um, it's seven questions. Fill it out. If you don't, no big deal. Um, and then the last thing is your donations are helping make this happen. So that's a link to donate. Um, and we have this sustainer thing where you can donate like five bucks a month. It won't hurt at all. This is a, if you're in a real hurry, you can quickly pay Palace a little bit. And then this last one is, if you haven't seen this, we made a can of whoop ass and canned do spirit, which like you can print out and put on an actual can. So if you need some canned can do spirit, um, we've got it. And that's the link for that. Um, it makes a great gift, even though it's after the holidays. So, um, so we're going we're gonna to be taking a couple week break because we're going down to D.C. to be working with a large unnamed organization, um, uh, doing a workshop with them, ramping up for the inauguration and beyond. Um, but we'll be back after that. And what are we going to do next, Steve? I don't know. I think we got to figure it out. Um, so if you, if you have a – we'll look at your answers on that evaluation. That will influence it for sure. I think – uh, yeah, yeah. So it'll probably be in like a week and a half, but we have to figure out that date. And we'll we'll send you an email, um, and so keep an eye out for that. And you'll get a video of this after too. So if um, if you have had to miss any of it or you just want to watch it again, that's fine. 
But thank you for taking the time and the attention. We hope this was helpful. Um, and we will see you next time. Steve, you got anything to close with? Bring on the love. There you go. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And we'll All see right. you next time.